Hello, everyone. I have a fantastic guest for you today. I'm here with Steve Grumbine, who is the founder of Real Progressives, and he's also the host of the MMT podcast, Macro and Cheese. And also, he is a co host of The New Untouchables, The Pecora Files. And he is here today to educate me, as well as all of you, about the fundamentals of modern monetary theory. Steve, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thanks, Mike. I'm glad I could be here. This has been a long time coming. For those of you who don't know, we tried to do this interview before, and there were so many technical difficulties that we had to basically nuke the entire thing. So, Steve, I'm so thankful that we can finally do this. And uh, I have so much to ask you. So, first of all, I think that my viewers know about modern monetary theory. But for those who aren't aware, what's the easiest explanation that you can give? Uh, what is modern monetary theory? So, modern monetary theory is a lens of macroeconomics in general. It is the way it is today. It doesn't need to be implemented. It doesn't need to be accepted. <laughs> Your acceptance or lack thereof is, doesn't make this any less more valid. It is the blueprint of how federal finance works in the United States. And really, it represents a free-floating sovereign fiat currency um, that's non-convertible, not pegged to gold. You can't force redeem it by gold. And, and this goes for countries all around the world, Australia, um, the UK, Japan. Uh, China, uh, Russia, uh, and a number of other ones. Uh, not the European Union, <laughs> um, but definitely the United States. And what it does is it says, hey, listen, you know, the pieces of paper are the least important thing when it comes to this. The question really comes to resources. Do we have the real resources to, to handle whatever it is that we want to spend money on as a nation? And the bottom line is that modern monetary theorizes that a nation that creates its own currency cannot go broke on debts denominated in its own currency. Pretty straightforward. It's the bank. It is the creator of the dollar. And the thing that really, really made it stick for me was that the dollar for the United States is really a unit of measure. It's like an inch or a pound. Uh, you can't run out of inches and you can't run out of pounds. And then the next question is, is that, you know, where do points come from at a baseball game or a hockey game or a football game? Where do those points come from? And where do they go when you add them up and put them on when the game's over? Where do they go when you're done? It, they, they're just there, right? You, you keystroke them in. They're really a unit of measure for how many points you've scored in that game. Well, the dollar is the same thing in, in terms of the United States and around the world. What it does is allows us to have a legal arrangement. The U.S. has the patent, if you will, on the U.S. dollar. It has farmed that out to the Fed uh, to kind of be its central bank. It was just spoken into uh, existence by Congress in 1913. And it has been the subject of every possible conspiracy under the sun for the last, I don't know, forever. Um, so really what you've got is a blueprint for how federal finance works. It's an operations manual. And it describes perfectly um, how federal finance actually works. Most of what we see today by Congress and by our newspapers and our other media outlets is a lot of fiction, a lot of stuff that was taught in school incorrectly, um, beginning with you know how money even comes to be. And most of the people think that the United States government has to borrow money from China. It has to borrow money from some nefarious bank or the Rothschilds and all the other crazy stuff that goes around out there. And in reality is that when Congress spends money, when it authorizes spending, okay, president signs a bill into law, they send that over to the federal reserve who then in fact keystrokes with, you know, their little fingers on a keyboard dollars into the treasury's accounts. The treasury then spends those dollars into existence that it didn't exist before. It didn't come from your tax dollars. And that brings us to the next big thing that MMT talks about, which is the role of taxation. We have what they call a tax-driven economy. It's not that taxes actually pay for anything because taxes are functionally deleted when they're received. What taxes do is they provide the magnet that keeps the circuit going. By having an obligation payable only in the nation's unit of account, you have a situation, an, an obligation that causes us to require to get those pieces of paper, those, those dollars. And so we have to find a way to get those dollars, right? And so the government uses that as a way of provisioning itself. This goes back to the day of Kings and stuff like that, where a King would say, Hey, I want to build an aqueduct. I want to build a Coliseum. I want to have a standing army. And 
you know, the people in the town and say, Hey, I'd like to build this thing. Will you come help me? And guys like, uh, no, I'm, I'm out here picking potatoes and I'm having fun with my kids and I'm fishing. I'm, I'm not interested in doing that. And he goes, well, I'll give you this gold coin. And the guy says, well, I'm not really interested in the gold coin. What am I going to do with your gold coin? He says, good point. He says, I tell you what, this coin with my face on it, you have to pay 10 of these to keep your house. Oh shoot. Well, how do I get those coins? Funny. You should ask that. I want to build a Coliseum. I want to build an aqueduct. I want to build a standing army, whatever. And so that's the story of that state money. And it's been going on since the day of Caesar's render under Caesar, right? It, it, Caesar didn't need the money. He already had the money. Just like the United States doesn't need the money. It doesn't need your tax dollar to spend. It requires your tax dollar to stave off inflation, to, to create different uh, behaviors, to modify behaviors and to incentivize or disincentivize certain behaviors. So that's kind of the net net of modern monetary theory. Basically says we don't have an, a budgetary constraint that matters other than a fictional one we put on it. We have an inflationary constraint, and it depends how much inflation do we want in the economy. And maybe we want a little, maybe we want a little bit less. It, it just depends. And that's how you would do your tax base. That's how you would do interest rates to be able to adjust to accommodate inflation concerns. That's a long story, but that's that's it in a nutshell. No, and that's that's a really, I think, excellent summary. And the reason why this is so important for those who don't already understand is because the implications of this are absolutely world changing. Um, if we actually acknowledge money for what it is and have a realistic view of the way that money works as a country, then there's no excuses anymore. There's no more questions of how do we pay for Medicare for all or are there enough rich people to tax in order to do policies X, Y and Z? The money's already there. It's just a matter of we're not doing what we need to do to take care of our people. And once you understand the way that money works through the lens of modern monetary theory, then it actually makes sense. And, you know, the United States, we've kind of been stuck on what has been known as voodoo economics for decades now, trickle down economics. And all of this, I, I think we're at, on the cusp of a paradigm shift. I don't necessarily know that a lot of politicians will embrace modern monetary theory, but it's certainly become more popular. And I know that the book, The Deficit Myth by uh, Stephanie Kelton, I just started reading that. So I've always had, you know, an understanding and knowledge of uh, the deficit myth. But after reading her book, or at least most of her book, now I'm a true believer. And now it's just a matter of actually learning how to talk about it in a way that makes it catch on because really and ultimately like, at the end of the day you know what normal americans believe or don't believe doesn't matter it's what the government actually does so my question to you is how do we actually push politicians to accept modern monetary theory republicans have functionally done modern monetary theory when they're in power is that is that correct so That's how do we get the left true. to do it <laughs> well you know it, it, it Great questions and great, great observation. The Republicans have been the kings of modern monetary theory since Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was the, I mean, I hate to sound anything positive about right, Reagan right. here, okay? <laughs> but let me just say, for for if, if, if bombs were food, Ronnie was the best progressive of them all, you know? <laughs> but they weren't, you know? He, he understood that we could spend, spend, spend on the military. OK, and this was a way to functionally make the economy boom. And, and this is why during the Reagan era, the economy did boom for a long time. And we hadn't gotten to the point yet where it started getting under Clinton and Obama and even W, you know, where, where you see the radical income inequality. It started under Reagan, definitely was like steroids under Reagan for sure. Um, but but the deal was, is that people, regular people hadn't gotten pinched yet. There was a lot of people. Yes, there was a lot of poor people. There was a lot of people that were cut out of the Reagan economy. But because of the timing, you realize we left the gold standard in 72. We went through Gerald Ford. We went through uh, four years of Carter. And then the Reagan revolution began. And he went through a recession at first. And, and they didn't quite figure it out because they had the Volcker thing going on in the 70s, the oil shocks, all the other crazy stuff to dig out of. But once they started really, really investing in the Cold War, OK, this is real money going through the economy. It doesn't matter whether it's good, it's bad. Don't even moralize it at the moment. Just think about it in terms of stocks and flows. Reagan had the thing going, screaming high, it just booming. So flash forward, 
And what you've got now is a situation where the average Republican knows when a Republican administration is going on that deficits don't really matter, not in the way we think they do. And so they do all the tax cuts for their friends, all the rich get richer, et cetera. But then when the Democrats take over, they, and, and you, when you talk to these folks, it's like you want to just give them a hug because it's like they're so wrong, but they have the right, they think they're doing right. You know what I mean? And they're like, well, we gotta, we gotta be responsible now that the Republicans are up. We've, we've got to fix what they messed up. And so they start jacking taxes up. They start, you know, trying to pay down the deficit, which is not even a thing. Um, but <laughs> they try and do all these things to be responsible. We got to pay down the debt and, and so forth. And you look at Obama. Obama was the king. He's telling us to eat our peas, and you know he bet what he didn't even put a trillion dollars out during the global or the great financial crisis. I mean, he was a stingy right wing austerian with a Democrat name, right? Um, but the fact is, is that as long as Democrats believe that they are the adults in the room and that they have to be the fiscally responsible ones and stuff, you're never going to see that. So, in my mind, the way to really get to the politicians and the way to get to, to the broad masses is to influence the influencers. And uh, a guy named Delman Coates is famous for, he actually talked to Ice Cube, who is now an MMT guy. So we've got no some kidding. people starting to wake up, right? Us little guys, we get to go for a big fish like you, trying to get you to see MMT. And, and so from my vantage point, watching you guys get it is my, you know, it's my win. I get the victories when I see you guys doing the lights go on. This is so exciting to see you with that book in your hands and to see you interested in talking about this stuff because we haven't received a lot of love from the, that upper crust of the alternative media sphere. Mm -hmm. I, and, and you said to me offline, a lot of people just don't know how to even frame it into their conversations. They don't know how to answer questions that this naturally brings up because it fundamentally changes the entire battlefield. If yeah. everybody's fighting, we need to raise taxes to pay for stuff. It's the price of living in civilized society. And the other guys are saying, no, we got to cut taxes for the rich and stop. You just hate the, you're just lazy and back and forth. The same, same silly pitch battle goes on. But once you realize literally everything they said, both sides is just bullshit. It totally, you can pull back and you could say, well, wait a minute, Republicans, I get it. You want to lower taxes. I do too. Hey, Democrats, we get it. You want to have robust social spending on the people. Hey, we do too. So, hey, guess what, guys? We can do both. Hey, you guys hate, you know, immigrants. Why do you hate immigrants? Because you're afraid they're taking your jobs. You're afraid they're taking your lunch. You're afraid of all these things. It's fear-based. But guess what? We we can pay people to have a federal job guarantee and every one of those people coming in the door instead of calling them a moocher or calling them whatever. Hey, here is a federal job with a living wage, with benefits, you name it. And it's not taking anything from you or your children. Wow, what a change, right? So I think that getting guys like you to, to be involved in this, to get it and then take it to your constituency, like what we're doing right now, this is huge. And those politicians, there are people that are in power that listen to you, Mike, and they hear this stuff and, and it's an opportunity to change them through, through your wonderful platform. And that's, I that's how I hope to get there. <laughs> I really hope so. I think they are, though. I mean, I've seen evidence. I mean, a lot of these people that were growing up in the Bernie movement then turned around and started running for office. That's true. And so now these people that we knew and loved on social media are now suddenly making laws. So right. they then they grew up listening to Mike Figueredo and the Humanist Report, and they grew up listening to Kyle Kalinske, and they grew up listening to all of our other friends out there, Jimmy Adore and you know all the other folks that are in this space. So it is an opportunity unlike any other to really bypass the rich, to bypass the, the power brokers in the mainstream media and fundamentally change the world from the grassroots up. And that's what we MMTers are trying to do. And you're being a part of that. It's great. I think that's our, I think that's the path forward, create a bunch of activists and make it happen. Yeah. It's really the first step. And, you know, for me, the question that, that I think about is because this really, it, it does seem like a paradigm shift in the way that we think about money and, and governance and whatnot. Um, are there any politicians that you're aware of that actually embrace modern monetary theory? I know that Stephanie Kelton was an advisor to Bernie Sanders on his campaign trail, but I don't know that Bernie actually subscribes to modern monetary theory. So is there anyone in Congress that you're aware of that supports modern monetary theory besides Republicans who inadvertently support it just by their actions, but don't embrace the theory itself because, you know, they wouldn't. 
Absolutely. Well, I can tell you right now, there is a metric ton of these folks out there that are being advised by MMTers today. Mm. Rashida Tlaib has put out two or three bills, bam, 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 that are literally MMT oozing. Number one, she put the ABC out, act out there, which was the, um, the digital payments to give people pandemic payments um, You know, on the card. Didn't pass, of course, but she wrote that. Um, now you've got Ayanna Presley putting forward a federal job guarantee. You've got, uh, yes, so yes, uh, you know, an AOC was brought into the fold. I mean, there's pictures of her out there sitting at a dinner table with, um, you know, some of the Modern Money Network folks and Stephanie Kelton on one side and Pavlina Chernova on the other. And uh, so AOC is definitely aware and involved with MMT. I would say that Jane Sanders and Larry Sanders are down with MMT. And I would say that Bernie has every step along the way from his time at the Senate uh, Budget Committee chair with him being the minority. He, he brought Stephanie in there. He brought Stephanie in on his first campaign and he brought her in on his second campaign. And she was part of Sanders Institute. I would say Bernie is knows MMT. I would say that he has been doing this for 50 years and he's probably not up for changing his language. I think that there's a lot of people out there that find this to be challenging, that have written a lot of books, that they'd have to go on an apology tour to explain away the things that they said were wrong. So I think that Bernie's contribution here is giving access to people like Stephanie Kelton, like Randall Ray and others um, who are really advising a huge huge cadre of new congressional uh, people and, and even senators. You know, I know Ro Khanna has been exposed to it. I know uh, there's, it, it, you would have liked to have seen Tulsi Gabbard who she didn't, I don't know what happened with her. Something weird happened, but she never got it. Um, but you know, there are quite a few of them that are starting to really get it. And um, it's very encouraging. It's incredibly encouraging. Right. Right. Uh, I also wanted to ask you because this is something that, is easy to dismiss if you don't understand it. And there are criticisms of MMT that I was hoping that you could speak to. Um, and it, it really, the main critique that I hear about MMT is that this is going to lead to inflation. If you overspend, that will lead to inflation. So what do you think is the easiest rebuttal to that argument? So the easiest rebuttal is, is that our economy is a bathtub, okay? The bottom, the drain is taxes. The spigot is the spending. So when we're, we never just keep printing money, that's a relic from the gold standard. First of all, we don't print money anymore. It's all digital. But second of all, the tax drains out of the bathtub. That's the deletion process. Money keeps getting spent into the economy. Money keeps getting deleted from the economy. So that's the standard answer, right? Bottom line is that we don't. In fact, we're way overtaxed with a very limited subset of programs and services that we receive. We are so overtaxed for what we actually receive. It's not funny. So there's that. The other thing is, is that why do you suppose that we never hear a peep one about inflation when we bomb around the world, when we do tax cuts, we never, ever hear this, but yet this right wing thinking creeps in and says, Hey, what about inflation? You're going to give somebody food. Hey, what about inflation? Alan Greenspan and Paul Ryan, you remember that guy, the cool guy with the red hat and the muscles, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> I love those pictures. Still cracks me up. They're so, um, they're so good. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he tried to take Greenspan to task. Now, Greenspan's the, probably the biggest jerk on the planet, mm -hmm. next to Paul Ryan maybe, right? But, but Greenspan and he were sparring over Social Security. And, and Paul Ryan was trying to say, wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be more solvent if we privatize Social Security? And Alan Greenspan goes, well, you know, I don't know if it would make it more solvent. He goes, we can spend as much money as we want to. There's no constraint whatsoever. As long as we have the real resources to create the economy for the people that now have this money, as long as there's goods and services to buy. For example, in New York City, if you were to try and rent a, an apartment, it would be through the roof. Why? Because people are squatting on those properties. There is limited access and they've premiumed it out the wazoo. So they have literally made it so that it's impossible to get housing in New York. Places like that where you've got a scarce resource like housing. So that's the question. If we want to give houses to all in New York City, we either A, have to build a lot more houses to be able to do that. Or B, we have to realize that the real resource constraint of the amount of houses there just isn't adequate to meet the demand. 
So this is an MMT truism. It's about resourcing the bill, not the dollars. The dollars are irrelevant. You know, it, 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 to, to pay for something is, is not a thing. We can do it anything. The real issue is, do we have the real resources? So the inflation thing is the most talked about thing in MMT land within MMTers because we recognize an inflation constraint. And the way we look at that is usually, do we have real full employment? In other words, if we actually pass a federal job guarantee and all of our slack labor is bought up, now you know that right now we manage inflation by keeping like 5% of the people unemployed, forcibly unemployed. It, it's NARU. It's the Fed's way of making sure you know inflation doesn't happen. And if you remember, AOC took Jerome Powell to task about the Phillips curve, which is, it's one of these fake models that economists do to baffle us with BS. And she said, you know, you've been using this Phillips curve here. And quite frankly, none of it plays out as you said. And he's like, you know what? I think our model's a little outdated. She goes, you think? I mean, you know, so this is kind of, it's starting to happen. You're starting to see it. And so the average person has been so infiltrated by libertarian Ayn Randian thinking from Milton Friedman and the old 70s thing of, oh my God, if we print more money, there's going to be hyperinflation. They always point to Zimbabwe. They always point to Argentina. They always point to Venezuela. They mm -hmm. always point to uh, Weimar Republic, all right? So let's just, for grins and giggles, knock them down one by one real fast, okay? So the hyperinflation, hyper, you know, ventilators, they always get caught up on these things. Zimbabwe, Mugabe had taken all the farmland from the colonizers and gave it back to the people, okay? The colonizers went ahead and burned the crops down, and they also had issues with the people not knowing how to farm very well. So their productive capacity, their real resources for Zimbabwe were completely obliterated. They had food sovereignty one day, the next day they did not have food sovereignty. So that meant they needed to buy things with foreign, foreign goods that they couldn't use Zimbabwe's money for, okay? So the, the, you had very, very scarce amount of food, and really you couldn't have printed enough money for people to eat. They were desperate. So this is what happened in Zimbabwe, okay? Radical shock to the supply chain. You go up to Weimar. The Treaty of Versailles was brutal. I mean, they were brutal. And the French, being French, they wanted to make sure that they were being paid in French francs. And the Germans were sitting there having German Reichsmarks, right? So debt in a foreign currency. Remember I started this out saying a country can never go broke on debt denominated in its own currency. Well, the Treaty of Versailles said, no, nah, you're gonna pay it in French francs, that's number one. There was also a strike in the industrial sector, okay? So they, they literally killed the production. And so now you've got a supply shock, debt denominated in a foreign currency and wild amounts of corruption. Obviously the Nazis, you know, I mean, let's be fair, that whole period of time was a pretty rough period of time. So that's what happened to Weimar. You know, you had the, the World War I and all the ramifications of the Treaty of Versailles. You go down to Venezuela and, and what you've got is once again, another situation where you've got a single commodity and their dollar is pegged Instead of to gold, it's pegged to the U.S. dollar. Their currency is pegged to ours. So not only were they ripe for messing with, you know, this is the thing. Whenever you peg something to anything, you peg it to gold, peg it to the, you can screw with the, the, the commodity or whatever it is that you are tying your currency to. And if it depreciates, now all of a sudden your ability to pay off your debts is eliminated. You can't pay your foreign debts anymore. And so they had a single commodity in fuel and in, in crude, not even refined oil, crude, okay? And the Saudis screwed with them. So, so you have them screwing with the price of barrels of oil, which depreciated their ability to be able to pay their debts. The, the only thing that they could have used was their oil supply. So once again, had nothing, you notice I haven't said anything about printing money yet, right? Not one single thing has been, it, hyperinflation is not a monetary phenomenon. It is simply not. It is always corruption. It's always some sort of a supply shock. It's always some sort of natural disaster or debt denominated in a foreign currency. And so you can go through this each step along the way, and it's going to always be something like that. It's never going to be an issue of printing money. So for folks listening, please trust me, take this one to bed. You don't want to talk about it again. Just walk away and call it a win. You know? um, but it, regular inflation, though, which is what most people cry about, but they don't really understand, is a rise in all prices. 
it's not a rise in my one thing or the other. However, if you have a, a real resource like petroleum product and it's short, you make plastics, you make lubricants, you make all sorts of things, cooking supplies, you name it, fuel for vehicles, fuel for airplanes, fuel for buses, trains, you name it. So all of a sudden, a rise in price of fuel will create a rise in price in those things that require fuel or petroleum products to make. So this is how you could get widespread heightened. I'm just using this as an example of a mm-hmm. common commodity that could really create an inflationary situation. But this is not what they talk about. They talk about printing money. It's got nothing to do with printing money once again. So printing money is, you know, usually happens after the fact with these things. And so what you also hear, and this is something to be thought of, this is important to think about, you know, back to the Paul Ryan, Alan Greenspan thing, it's like, can you create an economy where the real goods and services that people want are available for them, right? So you're not having shortages of things, right? So hypothetically, we go ahead and we give people Medicare for all. Well, Medicare eliminates a lot of noise around. There's a lot of economic activity that makes up all that denial of service that goes on. There's a lot of people getting paychecks to deny you service. And my goodness, you don't want to eat their job away, right? Well, Medicare for all is actually a deflationary, deflationary service. Why? Because it's efficient. And so now you've gotten rid of all these different revenue streams that you're thinking of when you're thinking of the medical uh, services and the medical system. And now it's efficient. So efficiency means less money spent, which means the economy is going to require you're, you're losing jobs. A lot of jobs will be gone if you don't have a federal job guarantee or a just transition to move them into other fields. And shebang, you've got a situation now where if you don't have enough doctors, nurses, gurneys, hospitals, whatever, now you could have a rise in prices over there. You could have a shortage of the real resources. So it's, I don't think you would have that because you have all these people that would be losing their jobs would be desperate to fill jobs up to, to fulfill the, you know, Medicare for all. But you know, that's, that's the other side of that game. I don't know. I hope I answered your question. I think that that was a phenomenal answer. Uh, it totally makes sense. And and you have such a good grasp of the theory and the material and all of these concrete examples that I I think that your advocacy is, is so important for it. Uh, just to kind of further hammer down uh, the concept of modern monetary theory. So could you explain the differences? I mean, you, you kind of alluded to it, but with the United States, modern monetary theory is applicable here because we have our own currency, as is the case with Japan, the UK. But why wouldn't this apply to the European Union, France, for example, because they use the euro? What specifically makes that different? So the currency user is the people that can't create the currency themselves. The currency, you know, issuer is the one that creates it. Well, in Europe, they have the European Central Bank, the ECB, and they have the Troika. They basically have this uh, system that is not state-owned. So France can't just print money or spend money into existence. And they've got percentages. I mean, I'm going to butcher this, so forgive me, my friends in the UK. Let's say (laughs) they have a 5% threshold for deficit spending in any of these states. Well, all of these countries are like Delaware, Texas. They're like Maine. That's it. Once they gave up their own currency, they, in essence, became like California or one of these other states in the United States. In the United States, every state here has a balanced budget for the state. The state must run a balanced budget. Now, they may invest in bonds and stuff like that to carry them through ebbs and flows that might short the pension funds and so forth. But at the end of the day, they cannot generate currency on their own. They could create a complementary currency. They could do a number of things, but they could not create the U.S. dollar out of thin air. Only the federal government can do that which is why you don't want to see states trying to do Medicare for all and so forth, because it, let's say California gets away with it because they got a big economy and they can absorb it. Well, try that in Mississippi, try that in Alabama, try that in Maine, try, try that in Pennsylvania. I mean, most of them will not be able to do that. So if you have any kinds of ebbs and flows at all, if you have any kind of shock, like a natural disaster or something like that. And let's say you have a pandemic. The only way you could afford this is through the federal government. Well, let's go back across the pond for a minute. If you have an issue, like in Greece, Greece is a net importer. Greece is not a net exporter. 
So if you think about it, all their money is leaving the country to go buy goods and services. And because they are no longer on their own drachma, they're now on the euro, they can't deficit spend enough to make up for their net importer position. Germany, on the other hand, is a major net exporter. And so they get all that money coming in. They make the great cars. They got the Audubon. They got all these cool things. They bring a lot of money into the country. And so they are able to make a robust social infrastructure. They're able to do all sorts of stuff. They're living La Vida Loco while down in Greece, those people are really, really struggling. France is struggling. Italy is struggling. All the Southern European countries are struggling. Spain is struggling. You name it. And so it really is which ones are the net importers, which one are the net exporters, and they're reliant on that European Central Bank. Well, I interviewed a guy recently that's talking about this new plan called fiscal money where they provide these tax credits um, to people that it's like an alternative currency of sorts. It's like a receipt that they give to the bank and it has small markup and the bank absorbs the, the negative equity, so to speak. And that's a way of bypassing the ECB's strict rules. I butchered that a little bit, but for anybody out there that knows what I'm talking about, that's the MMT friends out there in Europe. You, you know what I'm talking about. I'm probably not the sharpest on this particular uh, segment of it, but suffice it to say, none of these countries can actually print their own money anymore. That's why the UK stayed with the, the pound sterling. They knew that they needed to be able to print their own money, so to speak. Okay. And so they didn't want to give up monetary sovereignty. Um, you know, they didn't want to have, you know, forget the Brexit stuff for just a minute. It's just really about the currency because Brexit wasn't really about the currency because the UK never was on the Euro. That was really about open borders. That was really about jobs coming and going. And if you go back and you remember what I said about the federal job guarantee, if they had a federal job guarantee in the UK, they wouldn't have been worried about foreigners coming into their country and taking those jobs because that would have been absorbed. No problem. So just something to think about there. But that's really what the deal is, is that they lost their ability to spend money into existence when they need it. And so now they are heavily relying on taxes. They're heavily relying on investments and the market and everything else. It controls their existence. Unlike in the U.S., we are freed from the constraints of the market. The bond vigilantes can go to hell. We can do anything we want to do. In fact, we could even lower the interest rate to zero and stop worrying about selling bonds altogether. We don't want to do that because bonds are like UBI for the rich. And that that's really all it is. So anyway, right. I don't know if I answered your question. No, that, that makes sense. And even though you just thoroughly debunked this notion that MMT theorists want to print money, uh, in other words, in short, basically, uh, you know, if, if you don't have your own sovereign currency, you can't make the money printer go burr in, in, a, in a nutshell. Oh, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's I think it's important to understand that it's uh, there's something called sectoral balances, okay? And this is this is going to get a little wonky, so follow me here, okay? If we split the economy into three segments, we go internal debt, private debt, we've got public debt, and then we've got rest of world, okay? So rest of world we call the trade balance of trade, balance of payments on the trade side, okay? Private debt would be all the stuff you've made your citizens absorb in the economy, like student debt their car payment, their house payment, all that stuff, the, the, the level of private debt. And so you look at this as like an EQ on your, on your stereo. You look and see where the private debt level is, look and see where the public debt level is, and look and see what the trade balance is. If we have a net trade uh, deficit, okay, of say 500,000, that's 500,000 that has left the economy and gone around the world. And somehow or another, that 500, let's say 500 billion, um, has to be made up somehow or another, okay? And so this is where a federal government could spend money to offset that trade deficit to keep the economy humming so that those imports don't have a real negative aspect on the, the economy. Because really, at the end of the day, you're giving them pieces of paper for real resources, right? And so this is a really big thing. So if you, you're looking at these, you, you know, you could have predicted the great financial crisis, you could have seen the private debt through the roof. You could have seen the public debt down and you could have seen the trained imbalance and you would have known right off the bat. In fact, that's how MMTers were able to predict this and nobody listened back then. Um, they, they used the, the sectoral balances approach to viewing the economy and it, and it showed. So if you think about it like that, the only thing that doesn't matter is that public debt. Public debt is a misnomer. It's just the net money supply. That's all it is. 
So if you delete the debt or you get rid of the debt, you get rid of the money supply basically. So it, that every time we've tried to pay down the debt, what we've ended up doing is created a massive recession, a depression, horrible things have happened. So this is more fuel for the fodder we can keep talking about, but I just wanted to throw that out there for you. Yeah, you if know, I didn't totally confuse things by doing that. No, no, everything you're saying, it, it totally makes sense. And as you explain this to me and I get a be better grasp of MMT and the material, it's almost like this frustration builds because you explain all this and you think, wow, so another world actually is possible and it's really easy. So the question is, why, why don't we have Medicare for all? Why don't we have a federal jobs guarantee? And it's because this isn't, you know, um, an economic theory that enough people adhere to in DC, certainly Joe Biden, he's an Austerian. So, I mean, you know, lost cause there, but here's what I want to ask of you. Um, in terms of how leftists should approach MMT, I'm trying to work it into my usual political analysis, but it's kind of like I'm on this one rhythm where, I, you know, the the standard things that we say as leftists is, well, we, we need to tax the rich and we don't need to tax the rich. Do I want to tax the rich because I do want to punish them, contrary to what others might say? Yeah, I want them to, to pay, but that's not actually what we need to do in order to invest in social safety nets and, and public programs. So is there any advice that you can give to kind of just casually work this into conversations? You know, Medicare for all, canceling student loan debt. How do we as leftists, particularly political commentators, how do we talk about this in a way that's more easy to digest that might, you know, pick someone's interest enough to where they go and pick up a book or they, you know, start watching Macro and Cheese with you what do you think is is the gateway? Because I want to radicalize people as much as possible, yeah. and I want to get more effective at the way I speak about this. So what would you say to that? This is kind of a big, broad question. It's, this is a great one, though. I love this question. So, you know, I started off years ago saying federal taxes don't fund spending. It's a bumper sticker. You can fit it on a bumper sticker, right? And people's heads were exploding when I said that. But the thing was is that it made them think, and we got the talking, right? Mm -hmm. If you decouple spending from taxation. We can have two totally different conversations. We want taxes to be strong enough to make sure that the dollar has the right level of buying power, right? We want to make sure that the dollar has whatever we want, whether we want a hard dollar, we want a really strong dollar, or whether we want a weak dollar, and we may want it for different reasons, okay? Um, so taxes are really about inflation control, but they're also, and this is hugely important, they're also about making life more fair and balanced because income inequality in a nation like this is a toxic mess. It's a virus that destroys democracy. Okay. So if you think about it like that, you tax the rich because they're too damn rich. You tax the rich because it's the right thing to do. You tax the rich because most of their ill gotten gains are ill gotten gains. You don't make that kind of money without stepping over people and trampling them and quite frankly, milking off of their labor, okay? And and so there's a good rational reason to tax the rich, but don't do it because you think you're gonna pay for a program. Don't eliminate the military budget because you think we need to save money here to spend money there. Eliminate the military budget because you have a fundamental moral decision that you don't wanna blow up people around the world. Or maybe you wanna re lease those real resources that are tied up in the military and redeploy those real, not the money, the money is irrelevant. It's the real resources, right? So when we talk about the left, you know, and, and being a socialist, right? You know, you can talk a little bit about Marxian theory and you can start talking about labor theory of value and you can get into some of the stuff. It, in and of itself, you have to understand the material conditions of the day and understand where we are. It doesn't matter whether you want a socialist utopia, whether I want one right now or not. The fact is we are in a capitalist environment. So how do we either A, revolt and flip the tables and make it a socialist country, which you can clearly see we don't have the appetite for, unfortunately. People talk, but they don't have it. I promise you that we are not there yet in our arc. The arc of revolution has not struck yet. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, I think you're right there. <laughs> I wish I wish I wasn't because yeah. I'm being more radicalized by the minute. <laughs> I mean, I am reading yeah. some heavy duty stuff too, and it makes it hard to talk in today's, because it's so yuck, right? It mm -hmm. makes it even yuckier. But if you think about it from a leftist perspective, you know that your goal is to make life better for people. Your goal is to, right now we have an existential crisis with the 
environment. Okay. It doesn't matter whether we want a socialist utopia or whether we want to have a, you know, go crazy and go full Ayn Rand. At the end of the day, people will die. There will be migrants, you know, coming, we're going to climate migrants, climate immigrants, people that are moving away from the coastal areas or, or severe drought, you name it, tsunamis hitting their towns, you name it. And these people are going to be moving around because, hey, the place that they once were where there was food and water and, and toilets and everything else is no longer there. It's underwater. So you're going to have that. And imagine if India starts migrating into Pakistan and starts, you know, all these wars and things like that. So this is a real thing that's coming. And, and it's it's not something that we get to say, well, I don't believe that or not. It's going to happen. It's happening now. You watch it happen. So it's my hope that as leftists, we realize that our goal is to find a way to create public policy while we're fighting for a revolution outside the process, but we create spending in such a way that we leverage the power of the public purse to affect climate change, to affect these things and to re you know, reconfigure society for a sustainable world. And a federal job guarantee with a just transition, eliminating oil uh, based uh, employment and uh, coal, all these dirty jobs, eliminate them and then move those folks into um, you know, mobilize them like a Marshall plan almost to, to get them out, to literally serve in the environmental salvation that we need to go through. I think there's a tremendous opportunity there for the left to fundamentally change society with a somewhat of a revolution. Um, but you said something a little bit ago that I want to touch on. I think it's really important. You asked why, why don't we do these? Why? It's not just that they don't believe in modern monetary theory. If you go back and you, if you've ever read Howard Zinn, and the people's history of the United States. Howard Zinn clearly shows that, like, for example, the War of Independence in the United States was not a, a uh, you know, a, a workers' revolt. This was a bougie, you know, the wealthy landowners didn't want to pay money back to England. They wanted to be free to be rich here because they saw all the vast resources at their disposal. And they had all these slaves and they had all these people that are willing to work for them, you know, bottom line is that was not a revolution for the people. That was not an independence. That was rich people being rich people and using poor people for fodder. And, and so you ask why we don't have these things. It's because from day one, capital has sought to oppress the people and use us as labor, use us as whatever it is that they want. And so the more secure we are, the less likely we are to take the crumbs they throw at us. And we all of a sudden have freedom. We have decisions that we can make that are different than what they want us to make. And so the reason they don't want us to be secure, they don't want us comfortable, is because if in unstable you know, citizen is going to be a much more pliable, much more willing to accept whatever they throw at you. I mean, if you think about it, how many people do you know have actually said, I want to work at Google and I want to do this thing or I want to work at this company. I want to do this. Thing. No. You apply for a hundred jobs and whichever one calls you back, you take, right? That's, that's the world we live in and it sucks. But if you actually could choose, if you had a choice, you might choose something very different than what you do. You, I might've been a school teacher instead of trying to be an IT guy. You know what I mean? I might've been a, a bunch of things had I had the freedom to really choose. But the pay of a school teacher is not nearly enough to provide for and, you know, when you got stars in your eyes because they pump capitalism into your brain, you got to succeed. you got to be the maker. you got to keep going, going, going. You make very, very different decisions that are no longer rooted in things that maybe would have made you happy, like me being a history teacher. What a geek I could have been, right? Um, you know, open my own games workshop and play Dungeons and Dragons or something, you know, crazy, you know, whatever, man. I mean, you do things differently because capital drives you. And that's why these things are not happening because every time the government does for you, it's something that Wall Street can't provide you at cost. It can't yeah. profit off of it anymore. So that profit motive, and you ask yourself, how do the rich measure themselves by the distance between them and the next guy beneath them? And that right there is why they don't want you to have this stuff because how else will they feel superior? MMT allows us to make the rich irrelevant and do it anyway without them. I think though the problem is, is that we don't understand power dynamics. We haven't studied theory. We haven't studied history. And because of that, so much of the stuff we do, we think it's the first time somebody's ever thought of it. And if all you got to do is look at the French Revolution, go watch the Haitian Revolution, go watch each of these steps throughout the process. And you realize that this whole arc to get freedom, to get what you need, it's a struggle. 
there is no way around it and people aren't ready for struggle. And so this is where we're at, unfortunately. Yeah. Steve, you are blowing my mind right now. Um, I've got to ask you. So we're kind of seeing a lot more people become radicalized. Socialism is actually, thankfully, increasing in popularity. And you see people say, read Marx, read Marx. And then oftentimes they'll order capital and it'll be like, <laughs> that thick i'm a, i'm exaggerating a little bit prints down um, small too <laughs> yeah yeah so you know i always recommend them you know get the the marx angles reader get a professor richard wolf summary of marx it's called understanding marx and these are kind of like my go-to's my my socialist bibles if you will do you have an mmt bible because i think that this honestly is part of radicalization of the left. MMT has to be part of it alongside with socialism. I think it's the companion economic theory to the socialist world that we all we all want. Uh, if you could like simplify it and say, everyone watching this, if you're intrigued, pick up a book, what would you say would be the best uh, book for them? Right, so I would say that the three books are, A, you've got the one on your wall right there. The Deficit, Deficit myth. myth is absolutely must read. It is- I would agree. It is an airline. You're sitting there waiting for your plane or you're in the bathroom kind of read. OK, mm -hmm. it is not a deep thing, but you don't need to be deep. You just need to. The country can do these things. That's really at the end of the day. That's really all you do need to know. Okay? Right, right. That way you don't want to eat your peas if you don't want them. You freaking know they can. That's that's what that book will give you is is an insight into the overall the overview. It's not the be all end all. Mm -hmm. But it's more than enough for the average person. It's a great entry point for someone like me. I will Absolutely. recommend that. Well, I would say, you know, I read Warren Mosler's book, Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds. You can get it for free. You can actually go to our website at realprogressives.org and we have a, a PDF type version of it. But it, it's it's just a great, great book. It's super simple. But if you really want to start understanding the power dynamics, you need to understand the neoliberal um, fight. The, the fight of neoliberalism that started, you know, basically back in the Milton Friedman era and the Mount Pelerin Society and, you know, all the other things that have happened from the 60s up to present. And this mad push for privatization has fundamentally changed how we view everything. Milton Friedman and Volcker, when they basically said that, you know, if you print money, we're going to have inflation, has made every single person on the planet terrified of inflation, okay? And so as long as these kind of neoliberal things exist and are that go un re, you know recanted if you will or unfought back against I mean look at every single thing your friends and my friends and the alternative media even say I mean we are plagued with neoliberalism even when we're doing we don't even realize it I watched a Roseanne show when it first came back on the air, first episode, very first episode. And I only watched it out of a curiosity factor because I hated her, right? <laughs> but I watched this one episode and the very first episode, her and her sister are fighting about Jill Stein and, and they're fighting about Medicare for all. And she's like, you know, something, the only thing wrong with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money. Ha, ha, ha. When you realize that that's complete bullshit because the taxpayer myth the idea of the taxpayer dollar is the biggest racist, freaking disgusting line that the left continues to use like a cudgel. To, well, I want my hard-earned tax dollars paying for Israel. I don't want my hard-earned tax dollars. You know? And this is what Roseanne, it's baked in. This neoliberal thinking is baked into our churches. It's baked into our sitcoms. It's baked into our children's stories. Everything. It Neoliberalism is everywhere. And so eradicating that mindset, eradicating that space and starting to change it back to the public purpose and stuff like that is really important. So that's why I like Bill Mitchell. He has got a book called Reclaiming the State. And some people complain about it because it's, it is a bit about nationalizing, understanding the nation state and how its exertion of its ability as the currency issuer can fundamentally change everything within that nation state. Okay. But it talks about the history of neoliberalism. It talks about all the lies and stuff that are going on even to this day. You know, the the mis the, the idea that uh, somehow or another, you know, deficits today are going to be carried on the backs of our children tomorrow. It's a crock. It's bullshit. It's a lie. And and so his, this book, Reclaiming the State, to me was a really, really fantastic book. Uh, Mitchell and Fozzie wrote it. Um, and I would also say there, there's probably about 40 other books that I could recommend but I can't recommend enough understanding theory and history 
to go along so you understand how we have been divided every step along the way. Every time blacks and whites have tried to unite in class struggle, the the powers that be have thrown a wedge issue out there. They've given the uh, the poor white people a nickel more than the poor black people to create space. It's always been a divide and conquer strategy. Identity politics has been used as a weapon. It has not been used as a weapon for the people that need it. It's been used as a weapon by the power elite to keep us from uniting. And unfortunately, this continues to happen. So liberal politics tends to focus on identity, whereas socialism tends to focus on class. And I think that because of the two, we have to find a way to have an intersectional movement that understands the role of power, understands the role of history, understands the plight of these uh, minority communities and communities that have been ravaged by capital, and then also understand the MMT angle. You can't have them without the other. I mean, otherwise you just end up with what Republicans do. And, and, and I think it's important to have that understanding of class and understanding of money. You put it together and we can change the world. Yeah, I think that that is beautifully put. This does have to be intersectional. It has to be looking out for marginalized communities and also acknowledging the class differences, but realizing what can be done knowing modern monetary theory. Yeah, it's just, it's a new world if you understand it. And it's funny that you bring up the uh, neoliberalism that is kind of baked into everything, including uh, popular culture. I even find myself saying it to where I'll be talking on the show about how, hey, like, you know, we're getting our tax dollars extracted before we even see our paychecks. So I wanted to pay for something like Medicare for all. I wanted to not go to killing children in, in Yemen in war. And so it really, it is gonna take a lot of deep programming because when it comes to neoliberalism and, and just capital, capitalism more broadly speaking, it really controls every single aspect of our lives. And once you realize the way that it controls everything about us, uh, you know, from the minute we get up to the time we go to bed, um, then you kind of can start that deprogramming process. But I think that modern monetary theory is a little bit different in the sense that if we knew the way that money works, then we would understand the impact that it could have on us, if that makes sense. It, it's a huge thing. And, uh, you know, we talked before the show. I, I want to talk for everybody to hear this because I think this is a very important point. Neoliberalism wants us to have more money to spend because it wants us to keep capitalism alive. It wants us to go and buy some random thing, you know, some impulse buy. It wants us to go on a, a binge on Amazon. It wants us to, you know, just start buying things on these discount pop-up ads that show up on Facebook and other things. They wants us to buy, buy, buy. That's how capitalism thrives. And so throwing cash at the problem is decidedly neoliberal. And so when you think about the UBI, which is the sweetheart of a lot of Silicon Valley folks, pe the uberization of our society, right? The, the, the subsidization of shit wages. This is the neoliberal Trojan horse to dismantle the entire social safety net. Okay. And it, it goes down. If you look at reparations, even take reparations as a UBI of sorts, it's not, it's deserved, it's earned. Okay. But if you look at reparations, reparations is far more than just cash. Reparations is a substantive change to society. Cash is a part of it, but it's also fundamentally making the systems and structures that support people to be equitable, right? It's about bringing up people that have been left behind and bringing them up to where they should be, not giving them a handout, okay? And so when you think about the UBI, which has gotten popular because of Andrew Yang and Scott Santons and other folks, it is literally just throwing cash at the problem. It doesn't change anything. In fact, the Rantier class is begging for the UBI because the UBI will ensure that they just, it's a pass through. Here's your money for rent. Why not provide people with housing as a right? Why not provide people with debt relief? Why not get rid of student debt instead of here, we'll give you $1,000 a month towards your student debt. I, I want my health care for free. I don't want to be debt ridden. And all that throwing money at this thing does is temporarily provide some minimal relief, but then everything rises up because they know what slack is in the economy and the prices rise to meet that. And so unless your UBI is constantly rising, okay, and it's enough to really pay for your needs, you are going to be a subsidized wage hound for some uberization of our society. And, and to me, it is probably the single most horrific 
thing that has come through the door as kind of like the, uh, um, you know, it's like the, the, the silver bullet to all, fixing all poverty. It's a crock, right? Give people a federal job guarantee, a guaranteed wage paid by the feds, administered by your local community. We want local communities thriving again. Think of everything going on in your local community that is not funded right now. Think about the beautification, arts. Kids are no longer getting to take band class or going to gym. It's Everything is trimmed down to the bone, right? We have an opportunity there to fundamentally change how we view work. We can pay moms to stay at home, we, or dads even. You know, it doesn't have to be gender specific. And all those women out there that have stayed in bad marriages their whole life terrified of what it would be like to leave because they've got a brutal husband that has beaten them or whatever, they have freedom. So this is an MMT core staple is the federal job guarantee is baked into the thing because, you know, the tax creates the first unemployed person. If you remember my story of the king. OK, so MMT provides a solution to that with a federal job guarantee. Hey, if we're going to put a tax on it, we're going to provide you with a way to pay the tax because capital and, and private business, they have a decided urge to not hire you. They want to hire as few people as possible. It's not in their bottom line best interest to have full employment. So there's no way the private sector would ever provide full employment. It was going to require the federal government to step in. But the, the UBI is so sexy because it sounds like it is this cure-all. And all it really is is it, it, one more excuse for libertarian-minded people to destroy the social safety net. It doesn't matter whether you would do that. It matters that that has been a 50-year plan of the libertarians going back to Milton Friedman. And it's probably even further back than that. So this is why I said history is such an important thing in understanding theory because just throwing cash, even MLK, he's wrongly pinned as the guy who wanted UBI. Martin Luther King Jr. wanted a federal job guarantee, and he wanted a guaranteed minimum income for people that could not work, for whatever reason, could not work. It was not a universal give it to everybody thing, because what that is is status quo. If you literally raise everything, all you're doing is providing money. You have fundamentally changed absolutely nothing. And and. It's a shame, but I'm hoping people will wake up to this. Um, I've written an article out there that UBI is neoliberalism um, on steroids, basically. you got Pavlina Chernova, who has written the book, The Case for a Job Guarantee, and she breaks down these things in her book. It's all out there. You just have to ask yourself, do I want to be held prey to the private sector and their profit motive, or would I rather the federal government, who can pay any bill it needs to, to be the one that carries those basic needs forward, not cash. And I think that if you think about it like that, providing people's basic needs as a right eradicates generational poverty. It eradicates all the structures that keep people down. I think it's a fundamental game changer. And I think that we need to start thinking about basic need guarantees and not cash. Yeah, I totally agree with that, actually. And as you learn more and more about modern monetary theory, I think that these things kind of become evident because you can you can take a policy that is on its face, seemingly progressive, but again, we need structural changes and the only catalyst for that is modern monetary theory. We can't actually fundamentally reshape society with one policy like UBI. So Steve, you've given us so much. Um, is there any lasting words that you want to say before we close? Yeah, please, by all means, focus, folks, on our, our, you know, the current situation with the teachers in Arkansas right now. They're they're at, right now fighting in the Supreme Court against uh, big Wall Street interests because their pension fund got screwed up during the great financial crisis. And there's a lot going on right now with ex extreme control fraud that is blinding us from the possibilities of what we could do with MMT. It's the root cause, the fraud, the control fraud. Our entire government is in bed with Wall Street right now. And, and unless we dislodge that, unless we start making real substantive change by one person, each one teach one, weaponizing knowledge, they're going to continue to do that. And so we have a podcast with all the experts on it called, um, well, you, you raised it up, the new untouchables, the Pecora files. Um, we also have Macro and Cheese, which you can find on our website at uh, realprogressives.org under media. Both of these are, in my opinion, it's not me. I mean, yes, I'm in it, but it's really about the experts that I bring on and the conversations we pull through. Please do check it out. It's not infotainment. This is weaponized knowledge. 
And I hope that, you know, people take a look at it, listen to it and, um, and, and spread it around. It's really important. Well, thank you so much, Steve. It has been a pleasure. I appreciate the time that you've taken this time and the last time where we tried to film, but we couldn't because my computer decided to just implode. Uh, I really appreciate it. You're going to be my designated MMT guy if you're cool with that, and I will I continue to reach out. <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Mike.